Well, it's heavy jacket weather in Cape Town today. Cold front moving in, heavy rain. Uh, what we expect from from our winter and what we need. Um, so I'm grateful to God for that. I'm also grateful to God for the opportunity to to have a personal look back at the the um, 2,000 years of the church on the continent in this series which I've titled Jesus and Africa that I'm uh, doing in partnership with Discipling Nations. This is, I mean, my, my, my fourth lecture and this is uh, the, the second segment. So this is 4B. And we're looking today at, at what I call a missionary alphabet. Um, as we look in this, this fourth segment is about um, missionary agencies and agents uh, during the, um, the heyday of colonialism. And a philosopher friend of mine, Theo Rousseau, said, it is the role of the historian to make a source useful by asking the right questions of it. It is the role of a historian to make a source useful by asking the right questions of it. So when we look at history, we need to ask the right questions. And when we're looking at the, the story of Jesus and Africa over 2,000 years, there are a number of stories that we should be, uh, a number of questions that we should be asking. Should the Western missionaries have come at all to Africa? Or should they not have come? Uh, but since they did come to Africa, how should they have carried themselves? Um, should they or should they not have introduced locals to, to all the aspects of Western culture that they did? Medicine, e education, technology, and, and Westernized Christianity. And in what ways did missionaries challenge colonialism or compromise with colonialism? These are questions that we need to, to have in the background as we, as we proceed. And particularly, uh, since I'm going to look at what I call an African mission alphabet, I'm going to go through the African nations from Algeria to Zambia, I think it is, or Zimbabwe, I forget where I end, and, um, and just pick out a, a number of, of, of missionary stories, uh, well, a number of missionary characters from this colonial era uh, of, of mission. Uh, a sort of sampler of what missionaries were doing, because I think people don't know generally. Uh, there's a, a, a very Victorian book called Interesting Missionary Anecdotes uh, uh, that was doing the same sort of thing. I would not recommend this book unless you're able to <laughs> uh, cope with a, a, uh, the naive racism. <laughs> Uh, but it's interesting window into what people thought and what they thought was important. So I always say as a theologian, you've got to read books that you might not otherwise want to read. Um, and, and if you were my class, I would, I would prime you for a discussion at the end of my presentation, and it would be, what missional principles do you derive from these biographies? What are some of the obvious things you would have avoided? What are some of the surprising things that they got right? Um, a, ask, as, as Theo Rousseau points out, asking the right questions. Asking questions that will, will make the case studies, will make the history um, helpful to you as you live your life uh, in the service of the kingdom of God. We're going to start, I'm going to switch over to, to my slides here. We're going to start with Algeria. And 
here's a very sumptuous picture of sand dunes. Sorry, there we go. Okay. All in focus. And I'm going to start with a, an extraordinary woman called Lilius Trotter, an, uh, an English woman who spent many years of her life in Algeria in North Africa. Now she was one of those, those characters who managed to forge a way in a, the most extreme patriarchal period of of no, maybe not the most extreme, but in in against the the very uh, patriarchal background of Victorian England, Ruskin, the famous pa painter, said of her that that she convinced him that women could in fact paint, which is uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, John, for for that. Um, but she was involved in London. She was involved in the YWCA, in street ministry to to uh, prostitutes and and waifs and strays, um, young women coming in from the countryside and and needing shepherding in in the great city. And I, it's a long story, but she ended up in Algeria on an independent mission. And in 1888, she founded the Algiers Mission Band. Now, she was an intellectual of note. Uh, the, her books include Literature for Muslim Women, Literature for Muslim Boys, and The Way of the Seven, Sevenfold Secret. And she wrote in Arabic. I know someone who's interested in possibly studying her approach and her use of Arabic and its effectiveness. Incredibly uh, versatile, wonderful leader, um, strong character. But this is a sort of uh, attitude she had to cope with. This is a quotation from J.N. Murdoch, who was the, um, uh, the secretary of the American Baptist Missionary Union. He said, we must not allow the ability and efficiency of so many of our female helpers, nor even the exceptional faculty for leadership and organization, which some of them have displayed in their work, to discredit the natural and predestined headship of man in missions. Actually, he was American, so I should have done it in an American accent, eh? Uh, <laughs> but America, <laughs> Britain or America, uh, this was like unbelievably misogynistic. Leaders couldn't be counted as leaders because of the predestined headship of man in missions. And I start with Lilius because she was typical of many, many, many women who bucked the trend of, of male domination and actually did incredibly helpful work in different parts of the world. And switching over to Angola, Ralph Edward Dodge. Um, perhaps a bit late for the period, but I think typical of a, what I call the transitional, the transitional missionaries. He was a, a farmer born in Iowa and uh, became a Methodist minister in the Episcop Methodist Episcopal Church. And um, he arrived, I suppose, late in Angola, um, 1936 and became Bishop of the African Central Conference and was the transitional bishop during independence. Sort of a church technician, if you will. Um, farm boy to statesman. It's interesting to read his life and, and read about the, the, um, the, <laughs> the grace that he had to have in... Uh, helping a Western-dominated church to transfer its, or to change, to allow African churches to have their independence. Let's move on in our alphabet to the Cameroon. 
Ah, yeah, Joseph Merrick. I, I looked and looked online for a photograph of this guy, and this is the only picture of Joseph Merrick. He's sitting in a chair at a funeral, and it's hand-drawn, and there's no actual portrait of Joseph Merrick. He's born in 1808. Um, he died in 1849. So perhaps a bit early for, uh, for camera work. But he was born in Jamaica and was a, a, a keen member of the Baptist Church. He, he was recruited by the Baptist Missionary Society in 1842 because they thought that this, this man, this black man, would be, a, uh, would be effective as a missionary in, in Africa. And he arrived in 1843 by sea, at, uh, it was the only way to cross at that stage, of course, on the island of Santa Isabel, and gradually progressed to the mainland Cameroon. He was evidently very skilled and had high personal skills, and uh, the Usubu king, uh, King William, granted Merrick permission to found a church on the mainland where he proceeded in a very um, uh, in a style that was, was uh, very reminiscent of um, William Carey. Oh, brain fade. Um, <clears throat> founded a printing press, established brickworks as a, a to make the work self-supporting. He translated parts of the New Testament into Isubu. He was the first person to, to um, go inland and encounter the Bakoko people, the first outsider to encounter the Bakoko. Sadly, he, on a trip back to the United States, he died at sea at the age of 41. Interesting man. And a... Um, wonderful legacy to leave. Then we move on to the Central African Republic. Any picture with a donkey is liable to get caught by me. Um, Margaret Nicol Laird. Oh, she looks so much like a, a 1950s housewife. Uh, <laughs> that's her as a young woman. She was born in Colorado and uh, signed up for Baptist Mid Missions. Long story there that I can't go into. And found her way to Ubang Shari in the and the Central African Republic. Um, and she worked in Africa from 1922 to 1960. She learned French and Sango. And learning two languages so very different to each other is quite impressive. And she was asked to run the French school at Bangasu at the colonial government request. It's often happened to missionaries, uh, we'll notice, that the, the colonialists would see a, a white face with skills in local languages and, and then want to co-opt co that person to run uh, something that was of value to the co colonists. Uh, she had a lot of, of issues with compromise, with colonialism. She was asked, for instance, to work at Ipi and with the specific aim of gaining the trust of the Banda and because the colonists wanted to mine gold and diamonds there and, and not have people um, rob them of their own gold and diamonds. <laughs> the whole colonial thing was messed up. Yo, anyway. She uh, agreed and established a medical center at EP, um, uh, bringing in doctors and nurses. And she worked hard on the Sango Bible Translation pro Project all her life. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Uh, very interesting. She may had to make lots of compromises as a woman and as a Christian, 
uh, she was under a lot of pressure, but she did the best she could with the pressure she was put under. Moving to the DRC and the old man of Ibambi. I had a student from Ibambi once and, and he said that CT Stad is still remembered with affection all, you know, uh, almost a century later. He's, he's remembered with, with great fondness in the area. Now, this was a, another character. I suppose you have to be a character to be a missionary. He was born in Northamptonshire and was actually an England cricketer. He played in the Ashes series when the Ashes became the Ashes, when Australia beat England. <laughs> he also played in the return match matches in Australia uh, in the early 1880s. Um, but he, well, it's a long story, but he became, it's a long and interesting story. But I'm, I'm uh, just... Uh, have to touch on the some of the highlights. Uh, he was a missionary in China for I think seven years. He was also a missionary in India for a while, but but his heart really was was given to the uh, to the Congo, and he started a mission station at Ibambi. Well, I'm not sure that it was a mission station as much as he went to live at Ibambi, and from reading his. Uh, biography um, it seemed that what he did was every day he'd study the Bible and pray and then he'd do a daily public Bible reading and people flocked to Ibambi uh, his, he founded a group of like-minded people called uh, WEC the unfortunate title World Evangelization Crusade, which they have subsequently changed to World Evangelization for Christ. He he was a straight talker. Oh, I've got his cricket scores here. His highest test score was 48 at Melbourne. And uh, uh, his highest first class score was 175. And he's, he was a right hand medium fast bowler. And his, his best test takings were 2 for 35. First class, of course, his best was 8 for 40. The other guys were probably saying, study, can we also play? Sorry, that's for, that's for any cricket fans who might be watching. Uh, he, he was controversial because he was so outspoken. He uh, had what, what became known as the DCD attitude to worldly things. Don't care a damn, he says. I don't care a damn. That's caused some scandal in missionary circles, uh, no, in church circles, where people are more concerned with propriety than the urgency of the gospel. Um, that wouldn't, didn't sit well with C.T. Studd. My heart warms to the guy. Um, <clears throat> he wrote a poem. Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Ha! That's been a... <laughs> That's been something that's that's inspired me. I'd much rather be in the work, the rescue shop within a yard of hell, however you define that. So that's our first essay. We've got as far as D in the alphabet. We'll carry on with the alphabet tomorrow. Um, but I think I'll break it there. Let's pray. Loving Lord. So many of your children have lived lives of difficult service towards others in pursuit of serving you. Help us to remember them with respect and honor them by taking our own faith seriously. Amen. I hope that was helpful. I hope that gives you an insight perhaps into some of the the variety of of Christian missionary operation and and the the way in which different people with different personalities brought faith uh, brought their faith uh, with them to Africa. If it's true, please pass this on. If there's stories you think I should have have uh, spoken about, let me know. Um, if there are issues that, that 
this material raises, then leave me a comment. Send me a like, react, so that I can, I can uh, adjust my approach and, and be most helpful. If you want these slides, you can have the slides, although all this material is available pretty much online with a bit of digging. And perhaps after lockdown, um, you can invite discipling nations to run this course or other courses that we have to help your church um, work through the issues of the mission of God. That's all for today. Stay soapy.